All right, so there we go. Uh, mics are live. Welcome aboard, everybody. My name is Dubious. This is Fly in Formation. Uh, it's a spin off to my mix show. My mix show is called After the Smoke is Clear. I play independent hip hop every week. People should check that out if you like, you know, Canadian hip hop and independent hip hop, supporting locals, all that good stuff. Uh, but what I've been doing with the Fly in Formation series is tapping in and talking to individual artists from the different scenes across Canada. Because I really feel like. Um, you know, uh, there's there's support for different artists in their home cities, but uh, a lot of the time it doesn't seem to be as interconnected as it could be. And, you know, the people in Winnipeg don't know the people in Montreal and the people in Vancouver don't know the people in, you know, Saskatoon or Edmonton or wherever else. So I'm trying to link the entire scene up because there's so many dope artists across the country uh, and I'm doing it by just talking to people. So today I've been looking forward to this one for a while. Uh, I've got Fresh Kills here with me. He's a Claimed producer um, and you know sampler from uh, Toronto, I believe, based in Toronto. Anyways, um, welcome aboard, man. It's it's good to have you here. Thanks for having me, man. I, I Toronto is like where everybody people think I'm from Halifax, and I totally kind of love that. So I sort of like <laughs> I like the mystery of where I'm from. Like who knows? Okay. Who knows? Keep it enigmatic. Yeah. No, no, no. I am from Toronto, but everyone thought it was from the East Coast forever, forever. So I kind I kind of just let it go I was like, hey, did you live I'm in halifax here. for a while like were you out I, there yeah for a bit okay yeah makes yeah. sense um so dude like you stay real busy you just got back from the monopoly money tour uh that took you down into america was that like the first time you'd played shows in the states or, or how familiar with uh some of those places were you oh man i so before the pandemic I was probably doing about 150 shows a year for like, it was about six, seven years, roughly. I, I got my, my booking, I had a booking deal in 2013. And so I spent a lot of time on the road. I spent the better part of those 10 years previous on the road, uh, the States, Canada and Europe primarily. And so, nice. uh, but this run, I hadn't been back to like a lot of those places I hadn't been back to in a long time. So that was one of the things actually uh, we did it was Windsor, Chicago, Cincinnati, Atlanta, Columbus, Buffalo, and back home. And I hadn't been to a number of those places in a long time. And I st honest, I'm being honest, I got emotional a couple of times on that tour, running into people that I hadn't in years where, and you know what this, you know what, you'll know what I mean when I say this, where like you haven't seen a friend in a long time, you just pick up where you left off. Yeah. Um, and so there was a lot of that. And there's also just this incredible thing about being a musician where everybody kind of understands and understands from the point of view, like, I haven't seen you in years. Not, hey, where have you been? Why haven't you reached out to me? It's just like, everybody's excited to see you. Everybody's excited to catch up. Um, yeah, music friendships, like, they last a little bit longer than typical yeah, friendships when you're not talking to each other. Yeah, totally. And they're built on the, like, the bonds of like, how hard it is to do this thing. Um, and so, uh, it was just really wonderful catching up with everybody again. And, um, Cincinnati, I got emotional Buffalo. I got emotional straight up just because Real. the love was just right there, just right away for people that I haven't seen in some cases, haven't even thought of in years. So was it just people coming out to support or was it other acts who were actually on the show? Like as, as supporting acts, you know, uh, opening or whatever. Mostly just friends, but like, like in Buffalo, for example, uh, I hadn't seen Mad Dukes in a long time and Mad Dukes and I, um, we spent a lot of time on the road together. Uh, we did a bunch of records. Uh, his, his label was essentially became my booking agent and we were really thrown into the fire together having not really known each other. And so we, our friendship is just, again, like forged in the fires of, of, of the road. Yeah. And it was funny cause I didn't know if he was going to come out. He, you know, he's got three kids and, um, and I, I went from like, not sure if he was going to come out to seeing him and hugging him and him being like, let's do this. Like, let's hit the stage together. And I, I was I, honestly, man, I was tearing up. Like I, I was, it was just so wonderful to see him and love was just immediate. And, Touring does that where, especially independent, where you're relying so much on the hospitality of strangers and right. the just the charitableness and hospitality and graciousness and of, of all these people that barely know you. Um, and especially, you know, we talk about being like Twitter being toxic or just all this 
there's so much just toxicity and, and beef and everything everywhere. Yeah. It just rejuvenates your faith in humanity being on the road like that. I feel like artists kind of get a different take on that whole like social media being toxic thing, because I mean, sure, if you go wading through the comment sections or whatever, there's hate for artists, but there's also this ability to connect and maintain relationships with other artists through mm -hmm. that social media or whatever. So yeah, I, I feel like artists might take more from it than the average person does, right? Yeah, I mean, I think the producer side too, like the producer community on Twitter, for example, we like hold each other down and support each other and defend each other and in a way that is really inspiring to me in a way that, you know, um, like my feed is full of love <laughs> all the time. For real. And so, I, yeah, I feel like I have a, I, it's, I think you're right. I think that's a good point. I think, I think as musicians, we have different experiences yeah, online than, than maybe the average. Yeah. Cause other people aren't getting any gains from using social media. I think, you know, whereas musicians and, and artists can actually benefit from the networking and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, actually, just mentioning Twitter, it made me wonder, like, you're one of the few artists who I've seen from the hip hop because hip hop Twitter was huge. You know, I used to love Twitter um, yeah. and, and be over there all the time. And I kind of jumped ship on it with the whole Elon Musk takeover or whatever. Uh, yeah. And I, I've noticed you're one of the other artists who is actually active over on threads now. Um, partially trying. Have, yeah what do we do to lure people over there like is it do we just stick to twitter because i still see people going hard on twitter um, yeah it's a good point i think the thing the thing about threads that i really didn't like right away was that it was automatically following everyone like you had to go into your settings that's a that's a huge l like yeah. that is that is like because the whole problem with twitter is curating your feed away from all the crap you don't want to see and then here's threads like here's the better solution which is let's just fill your feed up w with a ton of stuff you don't want and then what now i've got to go through like a thousands of odd followers you've added to my followers that like it i feel like i want to start over yeah and they really and they really took like the bat the worst thing about twitter and force fed it it was like imagine you weren't a u2 fan and all of a sudden the u2 is on your phone the u2 <laughs> albums on your phone imagine all those people that were like that really like i don't mind you too whatever but like Imagine you hated you too, and all of a sudden the album's on your phone. Like, I remember that, man. I'm, yeah, I was around oh when that God. happened. Yeah. <laughs> like, imagine you just don't like them, and you plug your you plug your phone into your car and it's playing the latest YouTube uh, YouTube song. You're like, what? Yeah. I uh, mean, the thing that I do like about Threads, though, is that they've they've they seem to kind of like have countered the troll culture by giving us the ability to just like block a comment and get it out of our comment section. Like, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's that's my mm -hmm. my favorite thing about it. So I noticed that it's a less toxic community over there, and it might just be because the trolls get get muted or blocked or whatever <laughs> it's called. But yeah, uh, anyway, back to the tour, man. Um, so when you were performing, like you were performing as a as a trio, right? So de depends, actually. Oh. So it's in, I'm glad you asked about the trio because the, the Fresh Kills trio is like, it's a newer iteration of what I'm doing. Um, right. I, I perform with a keyboard player and a sax player, but I can't always take those, I can't always take them with me. So what I've ended up doing, and, and, here, and here's what's funny, like because in the, in the I want to say, traditional musicians community, it's very common for, say, you to hire a sax player to play that day and you send them the charts. Yeah, gig musicians like that, or whatever, right? Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. but that to me and like you would never in a, in a million years be like like ask somebody to be on the podcast like within 12 hours. Day of, yeah. Unless right? it was a real but, good homie or something, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but but that's common there, right? So anyway, so I I've had to get used to this idea and I've now done it successfully a few times where I hire local musicians to to join me, but a lot of the time uh, sometimes I can't find musicians. Sometimes they're too expensive. Uh, sometimes uh, it's just logistics doesn't work. Right. Um, so on this last run to Atlanta, the only trio show that I got to do was in Chicago and uh, opening for the Palmer Squares. And it was awesome. And again, I, I met, and by the way, uh, Chicago just has an unbelievable, just plethora of incredible session musicians. Like there's so many incredible bands and, and instrumentalists there. Um, and so I hired these two guys through this band called Sidewalk Shock that I'd seen years ago from there. And these two fucking maniacs show up an hour before, like a couple hours before we go on stage. Like I had not met them. I'd sent them some, some of the stuff. Yeah. And I'm just like, all right, like let's 
just fucking go. And they're just like, the Fresh Kills Trio, ladies and gentlemen. And then and then we go. And, and that's uh, daunting it, with your name attached to it too. Two guys you, you've never met. <laughs> yeah. Dude, it's absolutely terrifying. It's totally terrifying. And but in but because of that, it makes me feel like I'm doing the right thing. You know, it's it's that David Bowie thing about if you're if you're too comfortable, you're right. probably in the wrong place or push, whatever. Push the comfort zone, yeah. Yeah, man. And so those shows have been incredible so far. I mean, every time I've done it, I did one in Winnipeg with some of the Super Duty Tough Work crew. It was awesome. Those guys uh, are Chicago dope. Shouts to them. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, their new album's great too. Um, shout out to Junior T for his work on that too. Um, and yeah, so I've been trying to do more. So, but on that tour, just to answer your question, sorry for babbling on, but All good. it was the only trio show that I got to do uh, was Chicago. Um, I tried to do it in Atlanta. I figured I could do it in Atlanta, but didn't have a long enough set to really make it worth it. And But yeah, but that's my, honestly, the trio is like the full circle thing for me where I started out in bands playing guitar and I'm finally kind of back there again. But being able to do what I do on the pads uh, in a live band setting has just been really exciting. Hell yeah, man. Um, so also on tour, you had like Roshan and Spenny and Eric Gordon as well, right? So what were they mm. performing uh, kind of their own sets or were they interspersed throughout your sets or how, how did that look? Yeah, so we, in, in some cases, everyone got their own sets. So Eric's great producer and engineer. Um, he's been doing some incredible work. Uh, he'll do like, he, he was doing a beat set, then he backed Spenny. And then I would I would back Roshan and then do my own set as well. And then sometimes it was a mix. It depended on the show. So like in Chicago, you know, I did a whole trio set. In Atlanta at Controllerize, it was just me and Eric doing beat sets because that's what Controllerize in Atlanta is. Right. Um, and it was sort of a mix up. It, it was, a you know, different things. You know, the in-store was different. We kind of kept things really tight where we sort of mixed and matched throughout. And um, a, bit of, a bit of a modular style tour in that sense where some of them were producer showcases where the MCs were sort of guests and then um you know we mixed things up yeah yeah nice um so like if I, I saw you had you know for instance a, a performance coming up uh, on a sticky bud show I think um, yeah right so like when people just come to see a, a fresh kills performance what can they expect like is it you on stage with a sampler and are you mic'd up? Are you, do you hype the yeah. crowd? Like how, how, how does it go, man? Are you performing? So, the other question is, are you performing music that like from your albums or are you just kind of debuting beats that you think people will like or yeah. This is a great question. And it's even a, a better question with respect to the sticky bud show, because I actually got on a call with the guys that booked me for that, because this has happened to me a number of times where they I've been booked as a DJ, right. Where they think I'm a DJ and, they booked me to play an hour and a half and I, I like, I can't really, I mean, I can do an hour and a half, but that's not what I do. That's and, a long and, time to be tapping sample pads. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I can do it, but again, it's kind of like, I always have to sort of, there's a bit of an education moment where it's like, okay, look, like, what are you expecting? Because this is what I do. So the answer to your question <laughs> is I, I, I can, I can be modular to some degree. Like I can do beat sets that are more continuous uh, and that are more kind of beat head stuff, which is like dustier and slower and crazier and more like producer heavy stuff. I can do, you know, I can do like remixes and more routine stuff and I can do stuff. And I, and I cleared a room in Denver doing this, which was, <laughs> which was like my routine set, which is, I, I talk a little bit, set something up, play for two minutes, make a joke, tell another story, do a routine uh, and like, I kind of like that cause it lets me connect with the audience more, but for a, for a sticky bud show, for example, I mean, you know, th th they got all their dancing shoes on. They they're not trying right. to hear, hear me tell a dumb story about, uh, you know, the transformers in the eighties closer cartoon. to like an EDM show or whatever. Than, yeah. 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 A so dusty for pub that show, show <laughs> yeah. that's right. For that show, I'm going to do less breaks. I'm going to do more continuous stuff, heavier. It's gotta be heavier bass stuff for that. Um, but I think you're, I, I don't mean to give you a non-answer, but I do try as best I can to be me while also kind of, okay, what's this show about? I mean, I feel like the trio show, for example, doing a jazz trio thing at a hip hop show has really high impact in terms of, because we're sort of the outlier and we're, we, we sound different. We have a different kind of conglomeration of, of, of sounds Yeah. versus if I did the jazz, if I did the Fresh Kills trio at a, at a jazz club, 
it might not work. Some some of the things we do there might not work, right? So I try to stay modular while you know trying to do me as much as I can. In answer to the other question, later you're like, do you do do you stuff do you do stuff from albums? Sometimes that's hard, and I'm a true believer in the medium being the message where a song on an album doesn't always work live. It doesn't mm-hmm. and and it doesn't always work. It doesn't always work DJ'd out. It doesn't. My routines don't always work just to listen to, and vice versa. And so, uh, you know, it that's and I it, it sucks for me at times because I have to make tough decisions, and sometimes I make the wrong ones. You know. Yeah, um, but I mean, like disclaimer had all sorts of features on it too. So obviously, you know, you can't be performing yeah. tracks if people aren't there with you or whatever too. But that's right. That's yeah. right. Um, so you kind of spoke about how like this was an emotional tour for you. Um, I know you got married just before tour. Was it just after tour after. or just before? Just after. after. Yeah. Okay. So, well, congratulations on that, man. That's a, a big you. life Thank achievement. You. I appreciate yeah. it. Um, and, and, uh, did, did that play into kind of the emotionality of the tour? Like, I guess getting married right after coming back from tour, did it feel like a extended bachelor party or like, uh, I mean, kind of. Yeah. yeah. I, I, it's funny you ask if it was the emotions were connected because I feel like I've been getting more emotional as I get older anyway. I don't know what that is. And so I got, I actually got worried about it. Cause I was like, I was like, I'm getting really emotional at times where like, maybe I like should or shouldn't, who knows. And so I had my testosterone check last year. Cause I was like, is there something wrong with me? Um, apparently no. <laughs> good, good. Um, right on. no, I think like the, the Mad Duke's emotional thing was like, you know, I, I think what we went, we went through some crazy sh- stuff together. And so again, for me to, I, I went for the emotionality of that event was I went from thinking that he didn't care and maybe not showing up to like hugging me and holding me and being like, I can't, it's so great to see you. And I can't wait to rock with you. Like nope. there was an emotional distance that I traveled there that was overwhelming. The other one in Cincinnati was was my old tour mom, I want to say, and I feel bad. Blueprint on that tour was our tour dad, and he kind of took on the the, the the tour mom, if that makes sense, in terms of Blueprint. R- Rare Groove in Cincinnati was Blueprint's DJ when Dukes and I were on tour with them, and Blueprint was the tour dad who was like the drill sergeant, and and his DJ Rare Groove was kind of like took us under his wing, and I hadn't seen him in years, and he he bought two copies of every piece of merch we had and sent us off with more food. We had enough food to eat for like two or three days Yeah. and hugged me. And like, this is a guy who I, again, I haven't seen him in like seven years. And he just like, he gives me the shirt off his back, man. And like, if I talk too much about it, I'll get emotional. So like, I think it's, I'd like to say that I'm, I think it's just different, different situations. The wedding was beautiful. It was in new Orleans, which is just such a magical city anyways. And we you know, got we Mickey O'Brien in chat here, and I, I don't, I don't want to pry <laughs> or anything, but he says, "Tell him about the bachelor party." Um, <laughs> that was what he said after I asked you that last it's question. It's funny we're talking about Mad Dukes because of the bachelor party. They had me on stage with the strippers at the strip club, and the the strippers are like abusing me. <laughs> to, and and the DJ put on a Mad Duke song that I produced, and at one point on the DJ the the DJ saying. As I'm getting like, you know, they're like, I'm, they got made me get down on all fours and they're riding me like a horse, these, these strippers. Sounds and the right. DJs, the DJs going, this is where your music career has taken you, bro. <laughs> like, and it was just, it was just perfect. Like the timing and I'm, I'm on all fours. I'm just like, what am I doing? Uh, was was Mickey song. at that? Mickey got to yeah, come Mickey to that? Yeah, was there. And he Beautiful. Was, he was just cackling. Oh my god, it was so fu- it was so dumb. It was so it was just perfect. So look at, look at what your look at what your music has done to you. That's awesome, man. Just, yeah, mwah, yeah, perfect. Um, so like a lot of guys, you know, tend to get married and then it becomes family time. Uh, will this be That's the right. last tour that we we see from you for a while? Uh, I don't know. I don't any know. thoughts on that one? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I I definitely think I'm done with the long runs. I I can't do five weeks. You know, I mean, Premrock and I were doing five, six weeks in Europe every year. That's, that's insane. I, I, I can't do it. Yeah. I did three weeks last year in Europe with Shrapnel and Occam's Blazer. Um, and that was amazing, but that was too long. It was too long. And so, I mean, unless someone's trying to throw, you know, just a truckloads of money at me, I don't think I can do the long runs, but I, obvious, I, I mean, it's in me and I'll always, you know, I'll always be, I'll always be doing spot dates and, yeah. You know, worth asking if the paycheck is right then yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 makes sense man so um yeah. 
can you talk about Occam's Blazer, actually? Because I'm only familiar yeah. with them, like, through your working with them. And I know that I think, like, it, is Premrock part of Occam's Blazer as well? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, I'm but, glad you asked about this. Yeah, This man. is the craziest record I've ever been involved with. It's a, a seven-piece progressive jazz rock hip-hop drum and bass thing. Um, the story goes like this. And, and, and so I'm so glad you asked. I love the story. So we, we're on tour in Europe, and we show up in, in, in Vienna, Austria, and this proper Englishman shows up looking like with a you know, sweater over his shoulders and a, and a, and a uh, hat on, and he's like talking to proper English, and he's kind of a square, like, you know, and we're sort of like, okay, he leads us to the venue or whatever, we go, and he disappears, okay? And, and we're just kind of setting up and doing our thing, Prime Rock and I, and... Uh, we don't know where they are. We go, the place starts to fill up and we're playing this grimy, like under a bridge brick place, right? Pretty small, sweaty. And we go on and the crowd, you know, we're doing, we have a good time. But again, the band's nowhere to be found. And we're like, okay. And, and Guido in particular is nowhere to be found. And then crowds, places filling up, right? And they're in this group, they're opening, they're, they're closing. They're in this group called Proc. And all of a sudden, there wasn't even a backstage show. I have no idea where Guido emerged from. I mean, if you told me he walked through a fucking t time machine, I would have believed you. He shows up in neck-to-toe silver spacesuit with two saxophones at once. He And they break into this four-on-the-floor, like, avant-garde avant -garde jazz funk dance thing. Yeah, you can play, he, he plays two saxophones simultaneously? At the same time. At the same time. Is there some sort of connected mouthpiece or like? No, it's just, he just, he wow. just fits them both in there. That's He's impressive. Just, <laughs> God. And so, and they tore the fucking roof off. Like, Premrock and I are holding each other like, holy shit. And we fell in love with them, like, right away. We were just like, these guys are fucking crazy. Like, what the hell? Who are you? What are you doing? Like, how do, what do we do? And then so a few years later, we would try to connect with them every time we went back over to Europe. And then a few years later, they just booked a studio for three days. And at the end of our tour, we did the Vienna show. And my sax player that has done all my, that plays with me for years, he's done horn arrangements for the extremities and for tons of my records and plays with us all the time. He was on a cruise ship, which his contract was ending right at the same time. So he joined us. So we hit the studio with a drummer. The drummer and the keyboard player were signed to Fatboy Slim's label. They were like a drum and bass trio. So the drummer's a fucking maniac. Um, the keyboard player is this German fucking science, you know, hair all over the place kind of maniac, Christoph. <laughs> we had a full horn section. Guido, my horn guy, and Julian, Premrock on the microphone myself and, I, and I'm on the MPC and you're wondering if there's a live drummer and all these other musicians, what the fuck am I doing? That's a really good question. <laughs> I'm just playing samples and, and bleepy bloops and doing all this crazy stuff. Uh, and we, and, and we got signed to fake Four. the record Occam's blazer self titled It's one of the most crazy records I've ever been involved with and super fun. Uh, just out there record, man. But yeah, thanks for asking about that. Was that 2023 that album dropped or was that 22 or Sometime in the past few years, anyways, right? I think it was late 2022 that we dropped it in the fall. Okay. Um, yeah, and Fake Four, you know, put it out with us, and and th you know, big up Chesky and uh, dope. And everybody I actually Fake Four. Like, I was aware of that album when it dropped. I've been paying a lot of attention to the local scene for the past five years, doing my radio show at Sick, and yeah. like, uh, so in that five years though, like, man, you've been busy. You've done two albums with Mickey O'Brien. I, I interviewed oh, and yeah. talked to him about each of those albums and he had high mm -hmm. praise for you and kind of how you worked with him to, to custom craft some of the, the beats and stuff like that. Um, sure. but then, you know, you've also done like, uh, work hard to the retroactive album there with yeah. King just, that was yeah. recent. I don't know exactly how recent, but miscellaneous also with Phil harmonics and, uh, random yeah. beats. Uh, you did building a UFO with Matt LeBlat, uh, or sorry, Matt, mm -hmm. Le Matt LeBlat. Le Matt yeah. LeBlat. Yeah. That's how I say that. Uh, and then two before that with prem rock, right? Like two prem yeah. rock albums. So like, yeah. I, and I might be missing some too. Uh, I wouldn't doubt, but I'm probably then there's also, then there's also disclaimer. So I wanted to ask like mm. for an album that just has fresh kills as you know, the, the title artist and it's your solo album. Yeah. You're obviously incorporating other artists into it, but 
can you kind of contrast putting your own album disclaimer together versus putting albums together with other artists? Uh, like yeah, just f like total fear, complete self doubt, uh, procrastination. Uh, <laughs> just that is like the hump because I mean, you know, I should probably should have put out a solo record ten years ago, um, and I just didn't believe in it. I didn't want to do it. I mean, th th there's this idea like. I'm going to sit in a room by myself and like jerk off into a, into a pro tools. And then I'm going to be like, look at like here, everybody look at me, look at me. Like I, that's really hard for me. And, um, you know, like I'm a producer and engineer first and, and, and those roles are they're they're I'm background. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a support staff. Yeah. So, so much of the time the MC takes the spotlight. In, yeah. And I, well, and as they should, you know, and that's, and you know, I get it. I mean, I, I'm a producer and I, I you know, the, but I, I didn't really choose some of this stuff. Like, you know, the, the, the pad, even the pad playing, it was sort of this funny, fun thing that I was doing that sort of took off. And the gravity of it sort of forced me into the spotlight a little bit. Um, but, but yeah, so, you know, even, but even the routines, and I'll make this distinction too, is the routines are really, you know, when they talk about like Superman, like Clark Kent is what Superman's idea of us is. Right. So my routine stuff is what I think you want to see and hear. Right. It doesn't it's not that it doesn't have anything to do with me, but it's less about it's more about me just trying to please you. And in particular, trying to impress judges and beat battles that I was in. Right. Um, so the album is really trying to figure out what the fuck. What am I like trying to say? Like, wh what is it that I'm trying to represent? Cater to yourself a little bit more and what you yeah, want to make. Yeah. make the record I want to make. And so that was a real struggle, man. It was really, really hard um, to figure out what I wanted to do. And uh so that's just why it took so long. But um, but I do think it's an accurate representation of me, and I do think it's more of an accurate representation of me. And that like people would see my routine sets, and then they'd ask for beats, and I'd send them a pack of like really like emotive, smooth, chill musical things, and they'd be like, "Well, this isn't what I, you know, Expected. thought you yeah. were." And I'm like, "Well, yeah, because you know, so." Yeah, it was a tough process, but again, it was it was the rock that I had to get out from under. It was a, it was a cloud I had to get out from under, and in, in a lot of ways, it wasn't something that I was super. It's going to sound so strange. I have a hard time being excited about it. It, it was literally like a, a thing that I had to do. Like I, ha it was a process I had to do, um, and I'm just so happy that people like it because, you know, fuck, I, not that it would have mattered. I I had all these meetings about you know, with Spotify people and, and, you know, oh, like, well, you, if you do a variety album, then the algorithm's going to deprioritize you and you've got to, you know, like if you, oh, because there's a reggae song on there and there's rap songs and R&B songs and instrumental songs, the algorithm's not going to know what to do. Yeah. And I kept going through these meet marketing meetings being like, okay, well, sh what should I do? And then eventually I was just like, you know what? Fuck all this bullshit. I'm just going to put out the record I want to put out. And, um, yeah. And there so that's it what it is. And yeah. so, yeah. Nice, man. So being a little bit more, um, I don't know, painstaking to make, I guess, or whatever, something that you weren't as excited to make, does that mean we're not likely to see more Fresh Kills, you know, production albums where you're reaching out <laughs> to different artists to, to make your own no, vision? No, I'm working on it. I know how to do it now. Um, so I'm working on the next one and I've got some exciting stuff. Nice. Uh, it feels farther than closer to being done. Um, and again, it feels farther because, you know, you take so long to do your first record and then you don't have as much to draw from for your second. So sure. um, you got to live some things. Um, but uh, there's an interview that uh, there's going to be beat tapes coming and stuff too. There, this interview with, with Jazzy Jeff really rings in my ears uh, where he's like, you got to get everything that's inside of you out of you mm. before you die. Because if that's, you know, if it's sitting on your hard drive, it's not doing anybody any good. Yeah. Um, it's not doing you any good. It's not doing anybody any good. And that really shook me up, you know, cause like I'm sitting on so much stuff, you know, that I'm sitting on for no reason, you know? And so, man, I love yeah. that mentality. I've always been the type of, um, listener who appreciates, even if it's like a song that I don't like as much, I still want to hear my favorite artists, all of it. You know, I want, I want to decide yeah. for myself whether I like it or not. And, uh, <laughs> I'm not one to like, you know, 
uh, shit on an artist for for putting something out that I don't like. You know, I give yeah. artists a lot of leeway in that or whatever. So yeah, I encourage right. people to put out as much music as you've got, man. Like put it out there to the world and, and let yeah. the, the world pick it over. There's so many Absolutely. people. Absolutely somebody will find something they like right yeah 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 um you did mention having not as much to draw from for a second album maybe um is that just talking like life inspiration or because i did wonder like do you just have a vault of beats you know make a beat today and put it in a vault somewhere so when it's time to make a project you choose 10 that kind of sound alike and that's an album now or do you go about it where like okay i'm gonna make this album so it's time to start making beats for this album no, yeah, I'm picking because I'm always making beats so that I'm picking stuff. But I made this huge mistake when I was younger where I would hoard beats. Like there were beats that I would make that I loved too much to give away mm-hmm. or to send to other artists. And now it's kind of too late for the – like I listen to some of those beats now that I was so excited about then. And I'm like they're not as exciting to me now. And that's another reason why I needed – I really didn't need to put them out. And, and Bastard yeah. made – Scratch Bastard made this comment too that – another comment that kind of shook me where – You've got to put it out when you do it or cl- as close to when you do it as you can because it, if it gets old for you, you've got to put it on your back. Like after you put it out, you've got to put it on your back for another couple of years. Yeah. So the longer you wait, the less excited you're, you're, you're actually devaluing to yourself your own material. So you've got to fight that. Um, There's also a I lot think, of stories yeah. out there. Sorry to cut you off, man. There's also no, no. a lot of stories out there where producers – you know, have beats that they don't like very much and yes. then they hand them out to somebody and it comes back flames, you know, um, yes. 10 crack commandments or whatever. I've heard DJ premier oh. talk about how that was a beat that he just thought was a throwaway. And Biggie was like, no, no, he, give me this. Like he did that as a commercial for some, for some, yeah, it was a throwaway radio commercial thing that he did it for. Right. And then yeah. Biggie was like, what the hell is that? Well, th- that's another, hu- I'm glad you mentioned this because this isn't a, that's another huge part of it is, I don't know what's hot. I really fucking don't. Like I'm too inside of it. I'm the goldfish in the in the goldfish bowl. Like I make shit all the time and you know, you know, and there's the classic like the thing that took me to, you know, I'm going to like the thing that took me longer to make because it was harder for me to make and it represents me maybe overcoming some kind of intellectual obstacle or musical obstacle. Right. I'm going to fall in love with that thing versus the thing you make in 5 minutes you don't give a shit about and an MC's going nuts. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know where to start with how to solve that. Like, there's not even a level of, there's not even an amount of therapy that I can pay for that will, that will help <laughs> me through that. Right. Like other people tell us what's hot a lot of the time. Yeah. So, you know, I, I love this. And I want to ask you this because you've been asking some great questions, but I don't know if you saw that, uh, Jacob, uh, Collier, uh, Collier thing where he was sort of contradicting, uh, Rick Rubin's thoughts about how, you know, Rick Rubin says, you know, you got to make things to please yourself. Um, I read Rubin's audience... book and have seen plenty of Rubin clips. I don't recognize right. Jacob Collier's name, though. Okay, so well, the the, the 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 prevailing thoughts about it are is that is that Rick Rubin's book is quite preachy, and Rick Rubin has all these kind of rules and things. And Jacob's Jacob Collier's critique of it was essentially that, like, well there's no wrong way to create and, and, and there's nothing wrong with thinking about the audience and you shouldn't be judging things and everything else. And, and everybody was sort of championing this Collier thing. And of course there was stuff that came out about Rick Rubin being this closeted right wing weirdo and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. But then, and this last thing, and then I'm going to ask you the, how you feel about this. The last thing, so I saw this incredible tweet about this, where they said, well, it's interesting that Jake, that Jacob Collier would have this thought because if you listen to Rick Rubin's catalog, it so very clearly pleases a lot of people. Whereas Jacob Collier's music actually, while he's a musical genius, it sounds like he's doing musical exercises on records. Right. Right. So, okay. so how do you feel about it? Ma'am, to me, I, I like artists. My favorite artists, I feel like, are the artists who make the art for themselves who who are right and i've said this on social media recently that like one of the problems with new music to me with a lot of new music i shouldn't blank a statement all new music but uh with a lot of new popular music especially is that it sounds like it was made for people to like it <clears throat> you yeah, know it, yeah, so- yeah. it sounds like yeah. the artist sat down with the intention to make yes. something that will be a hit here or there the contrivance or... of it is showing in a way yeah yeah exactly yeah. so it's it's tough i mean i liked a lot of what ruben had to say in in his thoughts on on making music and obviously he's got something he's you know worked with so many great artists and made so much great music over the years um 
that I think that there's definitely something to what he's saying about like, you know, really f follow. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Follow these guidelines to make this product or whatever. Um, and I think, I think e in, in, there's an equal parts where Rick, Rick is also the goldfish in the goldfish bowl. He's doing his best to self analyze, but like, it's hard to like it's and this is you know I had this discussion about what genius is my opinion of what genius is is that it's something that can't be taught so like you can't teach somebody to have Rick Rubin's ear like Rick Rubin can't really teach you know like when he goes when he goes through you know Anthony Kiedis's writing book and sees under the bridge and is like what's this you know play me talk to me about this this is really good what do you think like you can't teach somebody how to go through Anthony Kiedis's book and, and pick that thing out no. as the thing. I mean, so, so in, 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 in so far as Rick also probably can't teach and maybe his book is an exercise in stumbling through trying to teach his genius to somebody else. And maybe there's mistakes in there that are, that Jacob's pointing out, but, and ironically to bring it back to what I'm saying is the most successful thing that I've done is something that uh, for other people. So like Premrock and I would work months and months on this super amazing art rap record. And we would travel all, we would travel thousands of miles over to Berlin to play it. And there'd be some kid in the front row who doesn't even speak English telling me to do the transformers routine. Right. right? So, you know, and I not, yo, and I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not complaining and, and never. I mean, that, that's a wild, those are wild moments for me where I'm like this, some kid over here knows what the fuck that is. That's crazy. You know? Yeah. Um, the internet's but powerful. It's hard. Man. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to, it's hard to square these things. And I feel like there's a balance and I don't know where that balance is. And we don't have to know either, you know, no. maybe, but there's, yeah. there's no hard answer to that one. Right. It's uh, yeah. 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 It comes down to people's personal opinions. And mm -hmm. I mean, te te teaching somebody to be a tastemaker is, gonna be real impossible difficult. Yeah, uh, yeah yeah impossible yeah i think that's something that just some people are gonna have and others won't but um mm -hmm. uh, looking at the track list i guess for uh disclaimer like I, I was wondering like are these all artists who you knew beforehand or um yeah, yeah. do you reach out to people who you don't know and just like the music from sometimes it's the only person that i didn't know that was on the album was brain orchestra um Everybody else were homies. Uh, even Fashan, uh, you know, we'd hung out, and there's a lot. Of, we have a lot of connects together, and we've hung out a few times and stuff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't. I, I, I wouldn't say like I know Fashan personally, but but I've know met him and hung out, and beyond we've hung out beyond, uh, you know, just like in the studio. And so, um, were most of those yeah. recorded in studio? Then, like, did you actually sit down with most of those artists, or was there sending files yeah. back and forth? Yeah, no, almost everybody came through. So, again, I think the only person that sent files was Brain Orchestra. I mean, some of the musicians sent files, instrumentalists sent files. Brain Orchestra was the only one that 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 sent files in for me. What I would say, and, and part of the reason why I, I, was, I was passionate about having him on the record was he, to me, really represents the new, like, this, this underground kind of blue-collar, uh, self-made independent spirit um and i just have so much respect for for him and the way he's gone about it and like and and the way he hasn't gone about it too um just you know vinyl releases and just staying on his thing and like look he's not necessarily you know maybe he's not on your top five mcs list or top five producers list um but in terms of young people that i see he represents the spirit of of things that i that are that i'm I'm excited about when I look at the younger generation, you nice, know, man. like, yeah, props so, for putting on for guys like that, because there's so many talented artists who get slept on because they're not that top five, you know, yeah. they're, they're not on the CBC's artists you should watch list or whatever. Right. That's right. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, it's good to see other folks in the industry, put those guys on and kind of give the helping hand to, to <laughs> boost it. Right? I feel like it. I feel like I'm me. He's bigger than me now, but yeah, he's bigger than me. I I feel like, yeah, I was honored, but yeah, <laughs> it goes I, both I, ways, right? Cross yeah, promotion yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, can I just take this way back and ask like how you got into producing in the first place? Like, sure. How how old were you when you first sat down and started trying to make beats? It was well. It was it was a my friend down the street had a four track. I was a guitar player, and he had a four track, 
and he showed me how to like record and overdub stuff. And that's really like, so this high school, this is 94, three, four or something. Um, where I was just messing around with a four track. And then when I went, when I moved out to Halifax for school, I went to, uh, Dalhousie Fester was my next door neighbor. And he like, just showed me like, you don't need a, we don't need a drummer, man. We, here's some drums right here. And I was like, what, like, <laughs> what is going on here? Um, and so me coming at it from the sort of the, the old school sort of more, but more engineering side and Fester being like, here's what sampling's about. Um, that's really what it was. It, it was just like, it, it, and it was like somebody prying open my third eye being like, wow, like I can, I don't need to just like, if I'm not, if I play guitar and sing, that's all I could do. I don't necessarily need any other music. Not that I don't need other musicians, but I can, I can build this stuff. Right. Um, that was just the most insane turnaround for me. And, and so it was really, um, 99 yeah 99 with my four track and then trying to figure out f cool edit and, and cool edit and logic and so so I, I talked to fester actually a little while ago and um i asked him about and i like to ask producers about like how important is the gear that you use to produce on and and hmm. he kind of told me that you know a lot of his peers tell him that he should like, you know, or have told them over the years that he should like get better gear or whatever. And he's always just kind of been like, yeah, I make do with what I got. Um, yeah. Where do you fall on that? Oh, how important is the gear? Yeah. It's really, really tough. Um, how important is the gear? Depends on what you're trying to do. Um, oh God. <laughs> Are, so would you hard. consider yourself a gearhead? Like, I feel like a lot of producers do get into this mindset where, you know, audio quality is the most important thing and they're constantly no. like upgrading their no cables and gearhead. speakers and, you know, like this, no. that and the other thing so they can mix better. Like my studio is like firmly, it's like 2010 in my studio, like for is firmly there. No, I, I hate chasing. I, I feel like chasing gear is a super dumb idea for me i think it just wastes money and i resent the companies for making us chase updates and fucking os's and all this other crap yeah um i'm not a gearhead uh but i do believe in like it depends on what you're doing ah oh, god that's such a hard answer it's such a great question um i feel like it depends but that's the non-answer that 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 you you deserve better than that um i feel like it's the it's all about the ear and not really like the ear is what tr really trumps that question. Yeah. Like you, but you need a fucking great ear to 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 surmount the lack of gear. I think right. when it comes to, and when we're talking gear, we also have to talk about software because you can do everything in the box, but knowing your plugins like whether you know your saturator plugins your dynamic eqs your side chaining like there's the mixed tricks you know yeah like you, sure. you look at some of these edm guys i mean if, if you look i remember being out west and looking at some of the pigeonhole ableton sessions dude it's like a fucking science project like it's fucking <laughs> it, it, it is like it's fucking hieroglyphics man it's tracks like, on tracks it's like, on tracks and buses dude, it's and, an yeah. yeah it's an encyclopedia of automations and filter sweeps and fucking it, like it is insanity what they're doing so that requires that requires a mind and an ear um i do think that you can surmount almost any gear issue in the box but you have to have the ear to, to be able to know um i also feel like i also feel like fuck everybody and fucking do it because how many times do we hear stories about our favorite records being done yeah. in the gnarliest of circumstances yeah 36 so, chambers was a microphone duct taped to a wall or whatever they say and it doesn't, <laughs> yeah. It, yeah and it doesn't sound especially good but it also doesn't matter so like again that's a depending question right like you know you're not going to be able to do a top 40 record on your laptop that was exactly where I was going to go. Yeah, but maybe you can. I mean, you know, so like, fuck, uh, you know, it's such a tough answer. But if, if you're trying to crack mainstream, uh, you know, playlists and and mainstream attention, yeah, I think there's a certain level of 
polish that's expected these days. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And labels will have these gatekeepers. Will you know, like you you come to the label with a thing, you know. Shout out Doc McKinney, who there are engineers and producers that are tasked with bringing a project to market, which is like you we finish a project, it's done, written, mixed, rain, blah 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 blah. Yeah, it's their job to bring it to market, which could mean anything from just saying it's done cool to reproducing the whole fucker from scratch for real man so yeah dude so okay you're a very sample based producer i love mm-hmm. sample based hip hop production yeah. um you know that's where my heart is and i feel like there's kind of a move away from it more and more as as time passes because and maybe, you know, some producers <clears throat> have went back towards it for sure over the past few years. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I feel like a lot of that comes from just kind of like, from my perspective anyways, like I know a lot of producers and have kind of looked at like what sample clearances look like and these kind of things. But like, I don't know sure. the real ins and outs of it, but it almost feels daunting to me to the point where like, well, shit, you need a lawyer if you're going to try to do that. Like, you know, you really got to be about your business if you're going to try to make sample beats. Then I also hear all sorts of stuff that comes out where I'm like, there is no way they paid for that. Like, they're they're sampling the biggest song from, you know, X artist. I don't want to throw anybody under any buses here, but um, you hear it all the time. So I just, I wanted to ask, and I know it might be a tricky thing for a producer to talk about, really, but like, how... How should producers go about navigating that whole sample thing? Like, is it tough to clear samples? Is it something that people should worry about doing? Because I feel like you're at a level where, like, if anybody should be worried about it, it, this kind of guy's approaching your level or whatever, right? Right. Um, My attitude is fuck everybody until it's a problem. Um, Because I think that I can't argue with the following statement, which is that your responsibility as a producer, as a music maker, as an artist, is to make the hottest fucking shit you can. Yeah. That's your number one goal. So, and that is, that does mean borrow, steal, kill. Like, like you, that's your, and nothing should, nothing should get in your way of doing that. And that's the spirit Um, of hip hop, in my opinion, too, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that being said, you know, you're going to run into, you know, you're going to run into issues. You need to keep your head up, you know, you need to keep your head up in terms of a few things. And so I, I mentioned this earlier, the medium being the message. Well, when it comes to sample things, it, it definitely is. So I'll give you an example. Well, okay. Uh, like I got, uh, who do I throw under the bus or not? Let's not. Right. Um, I don't know. You did. I mean, we set this interview up. I, I should have said this yeah, earlier, but because you said you could cat Williams, the, the, well, some of our heroes here. So oh, yeah. if at any point you feel like throwing oh. someone squarely under the bus, I'm here for oh, it. Man. Man, I don't I normally really lean could. into that aspect, oh. but yeah, <laughs> I really could. I don't want to do that, but fair. So when I'll give you, here's a good example. Uh, West side gun. Okay. Now, you know, a lot of the Griselda cats, a lot of that sound is a you know, loop rec- drumless beats, right? A lot yeah. of just looping of records. Right. So a lot of sample clearance issues there. Uh, you know, West Side Gun, I don't know whether they've cleared stuff or not. I, I honestly, I don't know. I, I can't speak to it. So there's not, I'm not going to sit, I can't sit here and say Beat Butch has got problems. But what I, will, what I will say is West Side Gun was on a WWF paper, pay-per-view event where he performed. And it was only then that the sample clearance lawyers came calling. Now, weird. think about it like this. He didn't get he didn't get flagged for putting it on Spotify. He didn't get flagged for putting the record out, making CDs, and not just putting vinyl. it on Spotify. He'd have millions of plays on Spotify. Yeah, you plays know? Like, exactly. Yeah, yeah. play. So we're talking like he didn't get sued for the vinyl. He didn't get sued for performing it for years. He didn't get sued for the video. He didn't get sued for 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 Spotify plays. He didn't get sued for any of that stuff. It was only when he went on an, a WWF WWE pay per view event where it became an issue and it, it only ever has ever become an issue when it comes, when it becomes about money, right? right? No one ever gave a fuck about sampling until people were making money. That's, that's all that anybody ever cared about. And let's, and let's face it, the numbers that you make, like the, like the numbers generated from a pay-per-view event are staggering. I mean, a single song placement on a pay-per-view, you're talking like, a WWE one where you're talking like a million people are paying $40 a piece to watch it. 
That's $40 million in revenue, not even to mention the ad revenue, which is probably equal to it or close, maybe, yeah. who knows? Yeah, likely. Yeah. It is fucking a staggering amount of royalties that are generated. And so, yeah, you know, Lamont Dozier is going to fucking, his estate is going to fucking call you, you know, because, you know, it is what it is. So, yeah, I, I, honestly, you do what you do until it's do what you do until it ain't until it's broken. Like your only responsibility is to make the hottest shit fucking possible. Look, advise your people that if you're going to be on a WWE thing, right. The movie TV thing has always been an issue. Like you need to be careful there. Right. Because the liability of, of those things are, are you're talking about million dollar, multi-million dollar shows and multi-million dollar lawsuits that like, you just don't want to be at the center of. Yeah. Um, there are blacklists for those things that you really want to avoid. So, you know, you just, but you just need to be aware of, of what and where things are being, things are becoming problematic, you know, like don't fucking don't sign off your song to play on MTV or, or, you know, on NBC or something like, think about that. Think about having musicians come in and reinter reinterpolating it. Think about having a lawyer present so that they know when it is clear, like, sure. You know, like having a lawyer come in with a musicology degree you know, those types of things once you get there. But the point is you got to get there. Yeah, makes sense. I yeah. think most indie artists and my own opinion on it has always just been like, what's the worst that's going to happen? They're going to try to sue for nothing. Like most people don't have anything that a corporation really can take from them as far as, yeah, dollar figures coming in off of their music or whatever. Uh, so like a cease and desist is likely the worst that they're going to see, even if somebody does notice that their sample has been. I have seen it get out of control even for, I have seen it get out of control. It okay. is, it, it... Lawyers are lawyers are creative motherfuckers. You know, <laughs> yeah. they like, know how to get you know, themselves money. That's for sure. Yeah. The one, the one that I well, I went through this with Decisive, where it happened to Decisive, and he that lawsuit that was levied at them were was really crazy, man, because they were like, they were like, well, look, it's it's it was a song that you sampled, that, and we know it because they used a huge sample, and because it was, we want it taken off all the digital, right? Because it's on all of the because it's on all the CDs, you need to recall all the hard copies Ugh. and destroy them all and send us proof that you have done that. <laughs> Think like a about picture what of them means. burning in a pile? How do you even... No, that? seriously. Yeah, you have to, you have to wow. film yourself just setting them on fire. It's, like, it, it's insane. Wow. Then, then they're like, well, what's a single? A single is an advertisement for the album. So now we want all the money from the album. Ugh. Then, then, and this is my favorite one, they're like, well, Lamont Dozier's catalog is worth, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars at this point, and its association with you has hurt our brand, has hurt the Lamont Dozier estate and brand. Yeah. To the tune of pff, add zeros, right? I mean, it's just, and that happened. Like they, 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 they nearly took down Urbnet, dude. They yeah. nearly took them down. I mean, it was. Anyways, Damn. yeah. Yeah. Um, so like I said, with the whole reference to, to you, Cat Williams, in the scene, like I don't normally try to ask <laughs> anybody to start beef or anything like that oh, on the show. Man. You know, I try to lean away from that and um, not go for the clickbait like he sure. said, what about this person stuff? But um you know, you, you did you did say on threads I did that, say it. that you, you had, you know, the ability to cat Williams the industry. So like I'm I was thinking about like okay, so what did Cat really say? Oh, he came out and he he talked about kind of like people cowing to industry practices so that they could get success. Is is that right. something you see happening has anybody ever asked you to put the dress on or like what what angle of cat williams -ing were you kind of talking about well uh i mean there's also the stealing jokes he talked about he talked well, about people stuff. stealing jokes I mean, too. Yeah. yeah i mean there are there are producers that are in your top five that have stolen shit um wholesale there's producers in your top five that have done dirty shit to find you know like uh, the, when you say the, steal shit wholesale, you mean like like other people's beats and they're putting their name on it completely or like yes. like just they sample too long and kind of like of your favorite like one of your favorite producers took a beat and I know the producer who they did this to who I trust inherently uh took a beat CD 
and took took a beat CD, a beat off of a beat CD, <laughs> put it on a Rough Riders side project, put his name on it, never paid, never paid said producer, never paid, never did royalties, never did nothing. Shasty. And it's the same beat off the CD. Um, you know, there's like uh the one there's one that you know broke my personal heart because he's one of my favorite producers i, I well i mean i, I don't want to name motherfuckers that will go through, but <laughs> yeah don't name in names MySpace, <laughs> in the myspace days uh so the, this one producer is one of my personal favorites he would he would go on european producers myspace pages and hear these beats from these producers that were digging up these crazy european samples right and what he would do is he would find out where the sample was from. He would befriend the producer, find out where the sample was from, and then have his record dealer go and get him the record and remake the beat, essentially. And this apparently happened a number of times. Um, I mean, it sounds kind of like Dr. Dre style, you know, like Dre gets so much credit as being this producer. And if you really like look into it, like he's working with a lot of different producers and a lot of different musicians and like, you yeah. know, has has all sorts of people doing stuff for him like well, that. Um, the ghost producing thing, we've seen this in EDM, the ghost producing thing is really problematic, right? And and it is as complicated as ha like literally just buying a song from a, a shadow producer and putting your name on it and putting it out as your big single. It's as It's as simple as that and as complicated as there are these guys that are super talented that know how to mix and make rec and bring records to market in a proper way, whether it's a mixing, co-producing elements and stuff like that to kind of beef up your song right. to make it ready. That's very common. That's very, very common, right? So, you know, if it's common, is it okay? I don't I don't know. We can that's another conversation. Well, maybe. and it can certainly be a helpful thing to have that happen to make your project better or whatever, right? Sure. Like, you know, Dre has undoubtedly there, been behind some very good music over the years. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. There's there's a there's a ton of session musicians that we've seen. I mean, the you know, the guy uh, Dennis Coffey who played the My Girl guitar riff. I mean, he was paid hourly to 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 write and perform one of the biggest most iconic soul record, you know, uh, licks of all time. And he has zero royalties. I mean, this is common. The one story, I mean, this came out in Vice, so I can talk open, more openly about this, but like The weekend. okay? I worked with The Second weekend before Abel became The weekend. His his name was Car uh, Carlos uh, Santiago. Uh, is it Carlos? Okay, wait, what? I don't know the history of The weekend. I've been familiar with it. Like well, there's an article you can read about this, but basically The weekend was a producer named Zodiac who created this concept of The weekend. Okay. It was his sound, and he basically was working with different artists to find the right mesh of to, to make it work and, and to get it to pop. Okay, and, so at this point, the lyricist has taken over the name The Weeknd. And... No, it's worse than that. Okay. So Zodiac... He'd worked with another artist before and then worked with this cat, uh, Santiago, who I'd done sessions with, and he told me the story about it, uh, where it, and, and it literally wrote and sung over the same instrumentals that Abel ended up going over, you know, House of, some House of Balloons instrumentals, some other stuff. And then when Zodiac ended up working with Abel, well, what's the difference between Abel and uh, uh, Santiago that the big difference is Abel grew up with with fucking Drake and grew up in Toronto and had all the connections and everything else so you know Carlos was from Edmonton you know and just like moved to Toronto to try to make things work and was a great singer and songwriter shouts to um, Edmonton for being home of a lot of talent fucking right but Edmonton yeah. Calgary area yeah man <laughs> yeah. he was you know and so so basically you know they a Zodiac and Abel they produced the first weekend record and Abel's ma manages to get it in the right in front of the right people and they get a deal and it's the record is brought to Doc McKinney. Now, again, I know Doc and I don't want to throw any shade here, but this is the process. I mean, this is the process. Doc McKinney takes the songs and he brings them to market. He's the late he's hired by the label as insurance to make sure that these records are going to be pop radio ready. So right? almost like an A and R used to do for for record labels, then, it, right? Like right. find talent and bring it to them. Except that it's not just find talent, bring it to them. It's Doc actually takes the finished material and reworks it, mixes it. Uh, in some cases, reproduces elements. In other cases, replays samples and like 
in some cases rewrites songs in other cases just you know puts a stamp of approval on it mm -hmm. but when when and everybody's okay with this right except that when the when the publishing splits come back and zodiac looks at the publishing splits and is like why am i getting like 10 percent of a song that i entirely produced it's fucked up like what the fuck and doc mckinney's all of a sudden got all this publishing da, 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 da. and so zodiac's like and at that point the label's like well you're either in or you're out like what do you you know like this is what it is Doc's done all this work to get this is what this is the record that we want. They kind of have you in a vice. You're fucked because you, you you know you can't take it back now. So the thing is, Zodiac says fuck you, I'm out, right? Right. But at that point, the genie's out of the bottle, and Doc McKinney knows exactly. Now here's the thing: Doc McKinney's a fucking genius. You could play Doc McKinney two bars of something, and he could go to the studio and fucking redo it. it. Yeah, and it would be better. I mean, he's that good. You know, but by that point, they already have the formula and they don't need Zodiac anymore. And they literally use Zodiac's like, fuck you and walks. And but the weekend is now the weekend. So, I mean, that's some dirty ass shit in my book. But like. Zodiac made his decision, right? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. like, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know what to do with that. But that, unfortunately, is such common practice that. I mean, it may be less common now. Who knows? I mean, I don't know. I'm out. I mean, look, I'll tell you right now. I mean, every time I had an opportunity, I've had opportunities to work with a ton of these different people. And every time in those rooms, I'm not trying to do a Cad Williams thing entirely here, but like <laughs> every time I dip my toe in the pool of the industry, I am just like immediately fucking, like immediately I'm dealing with, you know, fucking industry double speak and fucking bullshit and just dumb money shit and who's cool and not like it's just i don't i don't know and and it, again i have been feel the vultures circling a little bit kind of like, yeah, yeah man i mean I've, i mean i've been i've been openly disrespected in meetings i've had like shit stolen from me i've had like like I, you know I've, I've been assaulted in front of clients i like i've had every fucking nightmare you can have happen it's never you know even on the independent level when things get big, right? I mean, even even with Ghetto Socks and Decisive when they had their Juno nominations, those were painful times for me because of the way the relationships were frayed by that point. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a whole other discussion, but like it, it, it isn't lost on me that when I was my most successful, when I, when I had done Vaudeville and I had the two, you know, Decisive Vaudeville and Ghetto Socks' Street of the Day, which I had done almost entirely by myself in my bedroom, uh, either I produced the entirety of Decisive Vaudeville and mixed the entirety and done a lot of co-pros on Treat of the Day. It was not at my most successful. I that was my most miserable year, the most miserable year of my life. Yeah. Like far fucking none. And it's really hard for me to extricate those things. You know, it's hard for me to to say that those things aren't that my misery wasn't directly. Obviously, it was linked to what was going on in my life and professionally. So. Yeah. I don't know. I don't want to be a full cat Stevens because I think I look at the young kids to go back to the, to the point we're talking about. I look at the younger generation and I'm inspired by them. They, they seem to genuinely care about one another. They're compassionate. Their hearts are in the right place. They know, like they know who Biggie is. They know who KRS is. Like I'm continually inspired and I feel good that the, the world is being left in a better place than I found it. So, you know, despite all my horror stories, I'd like to think that the future is 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 bright and okay. And you know. I, I hope that some of those youth you're talking about who aren't jaded don't end up going into the same meetings and seeing the same industry pitfalls that you did. You know, hopefully they can find ways uh, to dodge that. And honestly, sitting and having conversations like this is is hopefully how that knowledge gets out to help people avoid that. Right. right? I think. Yeah. Sure. To a to a level like artists do have some responsibility to to talk about shady practices out loud, right? Like, and, and yeah. to, to tell other artists what type of stuff to look out to. So yeah, I appreciate you, uh, you know, <laughs> getting into that uh, pool yeah, a little yeah. bit there. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Dude, uh, do you have a few more minutes here? Like I normally sure, ask yeah, people cool. a couple of no, how cool, important man. are this or that? Okay, so. I'm cool. Uh, can I ask you how important getting grants is to a Canadian artist? In your opinion? I These mean, are just opinions. A it's as important as free money is to you. I mean, like it's <laughs> any other country, you know, everybody in the States looks at you like you're sideways. If you like, you mean the government will pay you to do records? Like, uh, why aren't you doing it? I mean, it's, it's, that's should be a daily practice. 
Yeah. Or a weekly practice as an artist in this country. There's no question. Nice. Um, how important is your local reputation in whatever home city you inhabit? I think it's important, but I also think that, uh, like, you get to a level where you've convinced everybody that you can convince of certain things. And when you're young, if first impressions are everything, you don't have control over the first impression a lot of time until you're a little older. And so you, getting out of your town, your local repu reputation isn't as important as like, because it's hard because the local reputation is built on things th that happen before you become the artist and person that you really are going to become. Right. And you're typically judged on things and known for things before you be, you know, before you become the thing that you want, before you're in control of your own, you know, uh, 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 reputation. Right. And so getting, it's not that important in that you got to get the hell out for anyone at home to, to change anybody's opinion of you anyways. I mean, we, we, we know this is the classic Canadian story where like, yeah, like no one in Canada cares about you until you go to the States and get love there. Right. And so, it, you know, it's not to say be a, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a douchebag in your hometown, but like, uh, I would say your local rep, rep, reputation, um, doesn't mean as much as maybe you'd like to think it is. Right. I mean, I, I see so many kids, young people here who are caught in this Toronto bubble of like, it's like, they think that it's that, that the gatekeepers opinions of them here matter. And it's like drive a hundred kilometers in any direction. Yeah. Nobody knows who these gatekeepers are. Nobody knows who fucking the guy that acts like he owns the fucking club or the artist that thinks he's hot right now. Like go to Buffalo, go to Detroit, go to fucking Montreal, go to go to Vancouver. Nobody knows who they are. So yeah. what, I follow a lot of the Toronto to blogs or whatever, and the the whole like top ten artists in Toronto kind of thing. Like a lot of the time, I look at them and I'm like, no, there are better artists in Toronto, in my opinion. You know, like I don't know yeah. some of these guys or whatever, really. Like, but uh, sure. Toronto knows them, and they're in there competing with one another. But like, yeah, like you say, go. Uh, a few hundred kilometers in any given direction and um you're, you're gonna matter. find people who don't know those people at all yeah uh, yeah. yeah yeah um this one is kind of custom made to you man like uh i ask a lot of people a lot of these same how important questions so i can build like little sure. montages of them but this one uh specifically for you like how important is it for a producer to have a good stage show to or to develop a stage show because I feel like a lot of producers are just happy to be in their, you know, basement or bedroom or whatever, making the beats and sending them off to people or be in studio working with the artists, but aren't really interested in being on stage. Do, do you think being on stage helps as a producer to get your name out and just I mean, get the image out? The, I, the, I got on stage because I was frustrated with how co-opted my material became because once you give a beat to somebody, you can't really control what they write to it and how it goes or what if there's, right. you know. And so I, my modus for getting on the pads and getting on stage was, I was motivated by that because, you know, like I would go to shows where like, I don't even know if they're going to play my song. If they play my song, do they even shout me out? <laughs> Am I just sitting here waiting for my shout out or what? Like, I don't know. Like, it's just, I felt dumb. Yeah feeling away about all that stuff and, so and even when I, they do shout you out what do you do <laughs> here i am everyone yeah okay. yeah i mean that, that's cool i know i appreciate that okay, I, yeah. think, I think i think mc should do artists should do a better job of highlighting who worked on records but for real at the same time it's not their job right like it's not their job and that that's the only thing that starts to happen is you can get mad about how you're being represented and what who you know you can't control where your placements are going to go so for me it was it gives it gives me a level of control so i i think that I think it's important because it gives a producer a level of control over their own destiny, which can't be taken then from you. You know, like if your whole world is, is placements, then you're at the behest, you're, you know, you're beholden to where those placements go. And so you can't always control who likes your stuff. You, you may not yeah. like the people that like your stuff, you know, like, fuck, you know, like, yeah, we all want like, you know, blocks of, of beautiful Amazon women lined up around the block to come see us play. But you know, like that's not, we don't have that choice. So I, I, I think it's important to have some performative element, even especially because the beat scene is so exciting and so inspiring and supportive. Like, I think, I just think there's nothing to lose by doing it on the one hand. I, I think the other hand, if you look at, there's other artists, uh, producers I can look at, like I look at a Nicholas Craven, for example. Yeah. 
and what he what he's been able to cultivate uh working with artists he wants to work with and making the records and being very 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 focused on making records and making the records he wants to make with the artists he wants to make right. his story is incredible what he's been able to do in montreal too i mean he's not in new york he's not in la he's doing that in montreal um so that's incredibly inspiring and maybe that's what if that's what you're about you know do that don't worry i mean nicholas craven doesn't do live beat sets he doesn't really dj right he doesn't have to um well, he, like you said, he's very selective with who he works with. Um, I, I also yeah. like to ask producers, like, how uh, or well, what do you think about having a beat store that just is like leasing beats out to people? Do you have that? Is that online somewhere? Or like, I mean, I have a couple from of what you just said. I take it you probably like having more creative control with who you're working with. Yeah, leasing has always been weird. I don't think I've ever leased a beat. Um, I just think that's. I don't know. I don't know. Like, I get it. I mean, it's a new thing. I got my, my head, I get my head around it. I hard to get my head around it. Um, well, selling beats to, to randos one way or the other, I guess. I mean, I, I do sell beats, you know? So like, obviously if you want to, if you come to me, you want to be, I'm going to do one, but I'm going to make you happy. If you got money to try and give me money. What the hell? Yeah. You know? I mean, that's what separates us from the animals. After all, we, we take money. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I dig it. I mean, I guess, I'll give it. How do I say this? How do I say this without coming off weird? Like, I don't. I don't get my choice of of, of artists I want to work with a lot of the time. Right. Like, I just. I just don't. And, you know, I wish it were different. Like, I. I, I feel like I've done enough to demand the attention of certain people, and you know, I'm not going to be a crybaby about it. But, I don't get to choose all the time, and so, but that, and that's part of the part of it. Uh, and, and also, like, I'm. You know, I'm an engineer and I'm a business person, and if somebody wants to do business, you know, Hey man, like if, if, if it keeps me in the chair, it keeps me creating, I, I'm not only am I about it and I'm not disappointed at working. Like a lot of people have this problem. They, they can't work with artists that they don't think are good or deemed a certain level or something. Look, man, like if you're excited about working with me and you want to do stuff and you, and you got, you have a budget, like fuck, let's fucking go. Like my job is to make you better. And if you want to do business, fuck it. Let, like I'm down. So um, I just look at it as I'm humbled that I'm humbled that I still get to be here and do it. So, um, if you want to lease a beat, okay. I don't know what the pricing of that is. I don't know how to price that. Um, yeah. but if you want to buy a beat, cool. You know, um, yeah. Interesting. It, this is interesting distinction to make. I don't know. Yeah, man. Uh, well, and you mentioned that you don't get to work with artists who you might sometimes like to. Yeah. Do you feel like there's a block because i asked earlier like do you reach out to artists who you want to work with uh like sure yeah how why don't you reach out to the artists who you want to work with or, or no i do yeah no i do I, yeah I, I send beats all the time okay. um but you, you know you can't control who you ha you know you have audiences with certain people you have you don't have audiences with others sure um easier to I build relationships like after a handshake for sure uh, yeah and also being an og isn't what it used to be right like like I have to constantly reintroduce myself to, to generations. Right. Yeah. So my OG ness doesn't, you know, my successes don't all follow me around all the time. Um, in the same way that they might've, you know, years ago or, or fuck it. You know, I, I don't know like what's the biggest record I've ever made. I mean, not big enough to attract all the artists that I want to work with. Right. So, sure. um, I think, and I think again, too, more people know me for the live, you know, the viral kind of style, you know, NPC stuff. Yeah. And so thank God I have that because fuck, who knows if I were just on, on just on, I think I make great beats, but, um, I don't know that I make contemporary hot beats. Like I don't, I don't know what the hottest thing is now. And if I could, yeah, it's not know. really like trend riding or whatever, for sure. Um, yeah. So you reinvent yourself and uh, dude, and I'm just humbled that I'm still here and I still get to do what I do. I mean, you know, I, it's, I guess the trend that you kind of are on the wave of is, is just the social media, like posting clips. You do a great job at posting clips of yourself, making you. the beats or playing the beats, performing the beats in different places. Right. Yeah. Thank um, you. Sure. Do, do you, are you one of the few artists who doesn't hate social media? I feel like every indie artist I talk to is just like, Oh, I have to do it. So I do it, but I hate it. Um, do you actually like uh, not mind doing that? I don't hate it, but I, um, it's just a lot. I mean, here's what I don't like about it is, uh, like there, I have so many platforms to service. 
like when I have a routine, yeah. like when I do a new routine, I've got to do, well, okay. I do it this way where I, I post on all the platforms. I do, I do YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, IG, uh, threads. I think that's right. So I, <laughs> so I do, I have to, I do six different posts and I have different word counts and tags for each of them. So it takes a morning to it takes a whole morning to kind of do it. Is that properly. what we're supposed to be doing? Different word counts and tags? That's part of the algorithm. I didn't know that. Well, bit. you don't get the same word count. Like on Facebook, you don't get the same word count. You get more of a word. You can write a whole okay. fucking diatribe on Facebook, right? right? Yeah. And on IG, and the tagging isn't the same. So you, you have to tag like people yeah. have different IG tags and Facebook tags. So, so you like, can't just copy gotta, paste the same thing. You got to do all yeah. that. And then, but, but, and then there's like the whole thing of like, well, I guess, oh, well, I should be posting to this one first and then that one later. And like, I'm like, I don't know how to do all that. And I'm supposed to, you know, I'm supposed to do my email e-blast along with that. So I don't hate it, but I don't get paid yeah. to do that, free to labor. spend a fucking day doing it. So I hate that aspect of it. I mean, just to remain relevant uh i've got to just i've got to just i'm a hamster in a wheel uh, I, I i do kind of despise that i do think i do think that there should be some kind of monetization but whatever i mean yeah. you know um fair enough man you also mentioned spotify earlier and that you had like had meetings with spotify and i was like oh prestigious i'm i'm in a rarefied air here with the guy who has no, spotify meetings no. nobody else has said that uh what are your opinions on spotify man most artists do not think highly it's of that a necessary platform. evil i mean it's a okay. necessary evil like i mean i don't know what links to, to send people half the time you know like most of the time you got to send a link tree that's yeah. like you know, because if people want to do it here, let them do it there. If people want to do it here, let them do it there. I, I like the idea of doing like the band camp thing first so that, you know, if people want to do it, they've got to do it there and they got to buy it. Exclusively on band camp. Yeah. You know, I, I, I like doing that. And then, you, and then you do the, you do the streaming stuff later. I think that's, that's good. Yeah. Um, I mean, also look, I mean, I mean, look, I, I'm not really putting out singles. I'm putting out, I'm putting out Walkman's. Yeah, you know? actually, I wanted to ask you about that, right? too. Like, I skipped the like, question earlier, but like, yeah. Who needs spins? Like, I'm putting out, like, I, I need, I'm selling Walkmans. The spins aren't doing nothing for me, yeah. you know? Yeah, that's dope. I, I'm putting out Walkmans with, uh, with, uh, hold on, with, uh, where is it? With, with custom, with custom beat tapes that you can't get anywhere else. Man, that's beautiful, yeah. Right? So... You know, collector like, item while you're getting the hey, music too yeah. yeah i mean if spotify drives me to this that's that you know thank you thanks thanks spotify right i mean that that's it that's a positive uh that's a positive outcome yeah fair enough <laughs> man um two more of these how important questions how important sure. is listening to legends of hip-hop and knowing the legends of hip-hop yeah uh, i think it's really important um even just from a referential standpoint i think like if you're going to be a good writer you've got to read, you know, like if, if you're going to, you've got to know, I mean, uh, like if, you, well, I, and I think too, if you have any chance of pushing the culture forward, if that's something you care about doing, I'm not saying everybody has to care about doing that, but your only chance of, of pushing the culture forward or pushing music forward is, is if you know, yeah. right. You have to know it. Yeah, um, that makes sense because man. right. Otherwise you're remaking the same things or it's derivative and Hey, look, there's a ton of amazing derivative stuff and I'm happy for it. I mean, I, you know, I, you could argue I make a bunch of derivative stuff. Um, and I'm happy there's still a market for that. Um, boom bap's never going to yeah. die, man. Boom bap is here forever. I think at this point, it might yeah. not be the like, you know, mainstream trend or whatever, but there's at this point, there will always be a crowd that likes boom for bap, sure. I think. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, Oh, actually, that was the last of these. How important? I already asked you how important is gear. Uh, so yeah, let's just uh, wrap this up, man. I'm, I'm sorry for taking extra time off of your day, cool. but um, it's cool. It, so can I get you? There's two more questions here. I ask everybody. Can I get you to describe sure. the local Toronto hip hop scene? Oh Lord, <laughs> I, feel, I don't know if I'm the right person to ask. Um, what's the local? It's vibrant. Okay. Um, there are there's so i mean there's more going on than i even know uh so i think one of the things that's exciting about toronto right now is there's a lot more women doing stuff that's exciting there's a lot more caribbean influenced stuff that's exciting yeah there's a lot more um 
there's a lot more there's a lot of young people that are doing really great sounding records like that are steeped in knowledge like there's a lot of young people doing uh uh old school sounding records that are awesome um i think there's a lot of old cats there that are exploring stuff which is also exciting yeah um and this is such a multicultural town so there's such a wild mixture of things um anything that you're looking for you can find here um that's a great description, yeah. man. Yeah. 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 Um, sure. Can you name some other artists from the scene who people should be up on? Hmm. And not, I mean, well, if you want to go wider than Toronto for this one, just shout no, out whoever you want to shout this out. This is a good one. I mean, I, I think Roshan is just coming up. I think he's incredible. I think he's, what's interesting about him is I feel like he can do anything. So I'm interested to see which, where he's going to go and how he gets there because He's so he's such an amazing writer. Yeah. And he can do so many things well. I mean, he can sing. He's been a top line writer for years. You know, I mean, he's got dance records that are doing well too. Top line as in melody? Is that what top line writer yeah. means? Okay. Oh yeah. yeah okay. He's writing he's writing pop melody stuff, commercial stuff. I mean, he's he's a writer's writer. That's yeah. the thing. Super talented um, guy. I talked to him May twenty eighth, actually, for this same program. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, man. Just to Yo, that's gonna be great. Yeah. Um he's fantastic. Um I'm a huge fan. I've always been super drama go who was formerly known as Brandon dramatic. Uh, he's always putting out incredible records, uh, but very low key. So you sort of have to stay up on him. Yeah. That's a name um, I don't recognize. That's the other reason I like to ask artists. This is because artists know dope. Is artists it hip hop artists you're out. asking? Uh, or just more specifically, general? but if you want to shout out, okay. I, I mean, for my own uses. Yeah. I, I'm only trying to really find hip hop myself, but if you have other artists, yeah. you want to shout out, do it. I love, I love run and gun. Yeah, uh, running gunner. Dope. Jo Mayers and, and and Goudini are fucking awesome. Yeah, um, I do love uh, Ghost Boy RJ and what his camp is doing, and he's got a whole camp of cats doing stuff that's exciting. Um, that guy only hit my radar recently, but I've played him a few times in the past year or so. Uh, stuff he's been, yeah, putting man, out. yeah, talented guy for I sure. I think you have to talk about the Baker's Club. I think you have to talk about Raz Fresco, Hell Six yeah. Letter, um, uh, Gritfall. Uh, I talked Grit to Gritfall on Flying oh, Formation. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dude, so fucking exciting what those guys are doing, man. Like, and who's the other you know, dude? Uh, they got Funk Low out in Montreal, too. Shouts, yep. shouts to all yeah, the Bakers man. Club. Yeah. They're crushing. You know, Bozak Morris, obviously, and uh, and um, uh, Sunreal. Uh, no, not Sunreal. Oh, my God, Sunreal. No, uh, Daniel Sun. Okay, um, yeah. Yep. Obviously. Um, oh, man. I'm, I'm really. Money. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm excited too about like some of the army stuff. Like there's this there's this girl, uh, Am I Blue? That's just fine. She's she's doing R and B and jazz, and she's just blowing my mind right now. Um, there's a lot of really cool um, R and B, uh, you know, stuff going on. So I'm yeah, I'm excited about that. But yeah, man, a lot of stuff going on. Hell yeah. Um, any plans to do shows or tours coming up that we can plug? I know we mentioned the uh, Sticky Bud show. When's that happening? Sticky Buds, April 5th, uh, Geary Warehouse, uh, Avenue Warehouse. Uh, looking forward to that. Um, we're doing, uh, I'm doing the Blueprint show here with uh, King Just and DJ Versatile. Uh, that should be great at The Real Jerk on uh, May 24th. Um, and then June 22nd, I'm doing, uh, okay, well, uh, I'm going to be coming out to uh, Edmonton, Calgary on um, early, end of April. So, Dope. May 1st, I'm in Edmonton with the New Standards Jazz uh, guys. Uh, Thursday in Calgary, uh, May 2nd in Calgary at Rated Ultra Lounge with the trio. Beautiful. With a couple of local killer motherfuckers. I'm excited. In Lethbridge doing the High Innovation hey, High that's where Innovation I am, Conference. Man. I'll see you there. Yeah, hell yeah, yeah, doing that. And then Saturday in Edmonton, back in Edmonton. I'm still waiting TBA, but uh, that's May 4th. Right on, man. So, yeah. Looking forward to seeing you out here, yeah. Uh, yeah, man. And what's the best way for people to support you or other artists that they like? Well, support me by going to uh, freshkills.com, F-R-E-S-H-K-I-L-S, checking the website, uh, get anything you want at the store. We still got Walkmans, there's CDs, there's all kinds, there's vinyls, all kinds of stuff. Um, if you want to support artists, it's got to be Bandcamp. You gotta mention Bandcamp number one. Yeah. Buy albums, <clears throat> buy merch. Um, it really does mean everything. Um, 
Look out for Patreons, you know, those kinds of things. And uh, buy you know. digital music, too. You don't always have, I mean, buy music at yeah. people's shows if they're there, buy a physical. But, I mean, yeah, digital sales stack up, too. <laughs> for yeah, sure. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, I'm Bandcamp, always yelling uh, that websites, one from the rooftops, yeah. yeah. All right, man. Um, thanks for doing this, dude. Uh, oh, I guess before we let you go, where are you most active on social media? Where should people follow you if they're only going to pick one? I'd say IG just to catch the routines and some of the more exciting stuff goes up there. Yeah. But uh, I'm a big fan of Twitter. I, I, feel, I feel like Twitter, I know we talked about the beginning, but I still feel like Twitter is where a lot of the writers and journalists and tastemakers live. And I learn, I learn the most from Twitter. Yeah, totally. But uh, definitely catch me on IG for sure, at First Kills. Right on, man. Well, I appreciate your time doing this. Uh, love and respect. Thanks a lot, man. Much, much love for having me, man. Thanks so much. Hell yeah. Peace. Peace, peace. All right, everybody. So uh, thanks for hanging out. That's a wrap on this one. That was a great talk. I enjoyed talking to Fresh Skills. It's always fun getting to meet new artists and, um, you know, just kind of pick people's brains about about the whole art and uh, indie grind and everything. And he had a lot, to, a lot of knowledge to share. So yeah, that was a good talk. Thanks for coming through and hanging out or uh, thanks for listening to the Ad Sick Mix. If you heard this after, um, after an hour of music from After the Smoke is Clear. Um, if you don't know, After the Smoke is Clear is my radio show slash podcast mix show thing. I don't even know what to call it a lot of the time these days, but um, you can find the archives for it over at mixcloud.com slash dubious. Every week we put together a new hour of uh, unplayed, brand new, new release indie hip hop from across Canada. Most of the time it's like 85, 95% Canadian stuff. Uh, definitely should check that out. Uh, if you like supporting locals and indie artists, they need the support as does a show like this. So uh, if uh, if you want to check out the rest of what I do, head on over to dubious.com. Uh, there's a merch section over there. There's, you know, a link you can donate that, all that good stuff. But uh, you can also just find me on Instagram. I appreciate it. And uh, people who spread the word, that's, um, that's about the best thing that you can do to help this show. Uh, if you know people who like hip hop, tell them about Atsik, tell them about Fly Information, maybe show a link to your social media or whatever. Greatly appreciated. And um, yeah, hope everybody has a good day.